Good evening. Happy Sabbath. I want to begin tonight with telling you a story. It's about a man who's lost. He's hiking through woods, forests, valleys kind of area, and it's snowing. It's a blizzard. He's cold, hungry, and he's alone. This man, he's hiking, and he's looking for civilization, someone to save him. There's no one there. This man's hiking, and he finally sees a little village, and he's heading towards it, but something inside of him says, turn left. He thinks, no, no, that's crazy, that's crazy. Why would I do that when I see somewhere I can go to be saved? So he keeps walking, but again, the voice says, turn left. He puts it to the side again, keeps going, but over and over, turn left, turn left. Reluctantly, he eventually gives in, and he turns left. He walks for a little bit, and he comes upon a creek. He thinks to himself, okay, I'll follow this creek. God brought me here to see the creek. Water goes downhill, downhill, civilization. Of course, makes sense starts following the creek. And as soon as he starts following it, the voice comes back, turn left. He's like, no, 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 this is my imagination playing with me. God definitely brought me here for the creek. Keeps going, turn left, again and again. Finally, reluctantly again, goes back to where he had turned off and goes back on the path that God had sent him. He comes upon a cabin. This cabin is buried in snow. The front door, you can most likely see about that much of it. He digs into the door, thinks God brought me to this cabin because there's food, water, and a place for me to stay until the blizzard goes away. Digs down to the door, opens it up, and as soon as he opens it, he hears a groan of pain coming from another person. Someone was in there. He takes his backpack off, pulls out a match, strikes it, and he looks around until he sees someone over in the back. This man was an elderly man, just inside of a sleeping bag, and he looked cold. He runs over to him, looks at him, examines him. Turns out he has a broken leg, and he's been there for a couple of days. So he runs out, makes a, excuse me, makes a fire, brings it back, starts fire, gets the man over close to the fire, warms him up, and once he's warm enough to speak, asks him what happened. The man said, I was hiking, and I fell and broke my leg. There was no one with me, no one knew where I was. So I found this cabin, crawled to it, and I've been here since and that was about five, six days ago. No one's come for me. And I finally remembered that there was a God I had learned about when I was a kid. And I sent a prayer up to him. And minutes later, you came in. Friends, that man would have died if he had not obeyed God's will, if he had gone straight rather than left. You see, God, unknowingly to the man, was preparing him for something bigger. He saw civilization, saw where he needed to be. But God had something bigger in store. God saw another person who needed to be saved. Friends, God is preparing each and every one of us for something bigger, something that we don't know is going to happen. But everything you do throughout your day, every single thing, is preparing you for that moment. Tonight, I would like to, give, like to give you a biblical and a modern example of someone who is prepared by God. But before I do, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to speak for you. Lord, I ask that my words will be yours and not my own. And I ask that as I speak, the audience's eyes will not be on me, but on you. Lord, be with us now. And I ask that one person in this auditorium will be blessed tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, we need to know the first key or main point of preparation. And that is accepting divine strength. Friends, on our power, we are powerless. We cannot and will not prevail on our own. But God is so merciful to us. He has a way if we have a will. A very popular trend today is not accepting God's help because he wants to help you do what you don't desire. This is why it is an imperative that you surrender your will to him. One example would be the story of King Ahab in 2 Chronicles 18. You see, Ahab wants to go to Ramoth Gilead to battle, and he is afraid to go alone. He requests for Jehoshaphat to come with him. So he says, Jehoshaphat, I need your help. 
I want to go to Ramoth Gilead. I want to go to battle. Josephat says, it sounds kind of iffy. I want to hear from a prophet of God. I want to make sure that this is a good idea. So Ahab says, oh, no problem, no problem. I've got tons of prophets. They can tell you if it's good or not. So he goes and gets his prophets, and he's like, tell us, should we go to war? They're all like, oh, yes, go to war. You're going to win. You're going to triumph. It's all going to glorify you. Joseph looks at them, he looks at Ahab, and he's like, you've got to be kidding me. I, I, I've requested a prophet of God. And Ahab looks at him, and he's like, okay, you got me. There is one true prophet of God. His name's Micaiah. We don't get along very well. He says a lot of bad stuff about me, so we kind of ignore him. But if you want, I'll, I'll go get him. And Jehoshaphat's like, yes, please. That's what I asked for. And he's like, okay, okay, okay. So he goes, gets Micaiah, brings him back. Micaiah has explained the situation. And he looks at them and he says, give me some time to think and pray and talk to God. When he comes back, he looks at them and he says, you should not go to war. You'll both die. You're going to lose everything. But for some reason, they went. They got the sign that they asked for. They still chose to go. They disobeyed. They go to war, and Ahab, knowing that he's most likely going to die, decides, I'm going to switch armor with a soldier. So he calls one of them over. He says, we're going to switch armor. You're going to wear mine, and I'm going to wear yours. So now there's a random guy wearing the king's armor, and the king is wearing a soldier's armor. They go to battle, and the man wearing the king's armor, he's on the chariot, he's up, he's in the triumphant position. He gets killed immediately, right off the bat. The king, wearing the soldier's armor, he sees that, and he's like, Whew, that was close. I missed it. Take that. And then there's another soldier, just randomly pulled out an arrow, drew back on his bow, and just let go. And on a soldier's armor, there's one spot right here on the abdomen that's exposed. And wouldn't you know it, the one in a million chance that arrow went right in, pierced him right in his stomach. And he drew back, went to the back, back of the army, he was protected, but he's bleeding out. And by the end of the day, he was dead. Then we go to Jehoshaphat, the other example. Jehoshaphat, he's surrounded, and he's about to die. But he did the one thing that most of us don't think to do. He fell to his knees and he cried out for help. He said, God, I made a mistake. I need you to save me. And the Lord delivered him, and he lived. You see, it's a sad reality. So many of us are lost because we will not cry out for help. You see, this story had two alternate, alternative endings. The one for those who disobeyed and relied on their own strength. And the one for those who repented and asked for God to help them. You see, friends, God has led me. And I have recently felt the calling to share what he has done for me. I'd like to ask that you do not feel sorry for me. As I share my story, I don't want you to look at me and think, wow, he's so tough, he went through all that. Rather, I want you to look at me and think, God did so much for him. How much more can he do for me? I want to start when I was about four to seven years old. I was a golden child. Not as in like I was so white that I would literally shine, but <laughs> more of a golden personality. You see, I was that kid who would run around, oh, do you need help? I got this. Oh, do you want me to do this? Oh, please, let me do it, let me do it, let me do it. Please, 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 please. You know? And if they wouldn't let me, I would keep asking. So pretty, people learned pretty much that they should just let me do it because I wouldn't give up. But it was on a kid level. It was a form of genuine, genuineness. It was sincere. I loved God, and I wanted to live for all that he stood for. I'd read a devotional every morning and night. I remember that like it was yesterday. It would be something special for me. My mom or my brother would come in and read a devotional to me, and I would just sit there with the covers right here, just like, yes, this is amazing. It was my favorite thing. But one day, that all changed very quickly. And I talk about this in a little bit, but if I had to think back and ask myself, what changed? What was it that I did or that I chose that just suddenly made me take a step back? I wouldn't say that it's one thing. Rather, I would say it's because of small compromises. 
You make small choices here and there, and slowly but surely, you turn up the volume of the world, and you tune out God. My life took a U-turn. I spent more time with friends watching TV or playing video games than I did with God. And slowly but surely, I left him without even knowing it. I told myself I was still nice, so I was okay. Or that my life was tough because I had a broken family. So God would understand. But friends, I was not going to go far in that mindset. My life was falling apart. My parents were divorced, and I was focused on myself more than anyone else. You see, as long as we're walking with God, nothing can stop us. But as soon as we depart from him, life goes downhill from there. God will strengthen you to obey him, but only if you want him to. Friends, my life was going downhill, and God saw that I was going to die very quickly. But I will say that everything I went through was for my own good, to refine my character. And as Merlin said this past Wednesday, the trials equaled benefit. But I was still lost. I was only in third grade and I had almost no friends, felt like I had no family, and I was miserable. But the sad part is that I was not gonna tell anyone that. I was bullied physically and verbally. And I was suspended from school a couple times because kids would lie about simple situations here and there. But the worst part of all for me was that I became the rudest person you would ever meet. I was horrible. And the even worse part is that I had no idea. I thought I was perfect and I didn't deserve what was happening to me. I wanted to be happy, but I couldn't find happiness. I went into fourth grade and my school had a week of prayer and it was a revival for me. It was a great time. But as I just said, it was a great time. It was more of an emotional high than anything else. I chose to get baptized that week for the first time. And it was nice, but there was three problems with my baptism. First one is that I was doing it because everyone else was. We were sitting in a chapel, an auditorium just like this, and the man up front said, Stand up and come forward if you'd like to get baptized. He made an appeal. I look around, I see all my friends standing up. Okay, well, if they're doing it, they're going to become holy Christian kids. I'm going to be over here listening to my worldly music and secular movies and so on. And then I'm just going to be alone. I have to stand up and do it. I have to stay with them. I'm going to be the odd one out. So I stood up and went forward. The second problem is that I didn't even know what I believed. I was raised in the Adventist church. And besides going to church on Saturday and the fact that I love Jesus, I didn't know anything else. I walked up front because my friends were, not because I believed that I had a savior. And the third problem, and I think this is a common misconception with baptism, is that I thought it would get easier after that. I thought that because I love Jesus and because I publicly stood up on a stage and said, I wanna live for him, that Satan couldn't touch me. I thought that because I was given a certificate that said you are baptized in the Seventh-day Adventist church, that I would be invincible. Oh, how wrong I was. It isn't just saying it once and you're good, and it isn't waking up every morning and saying it. It's so much more than that. It's something amazing. It's a daily, hourly, even moment by moment connection with your Father in heaven. In this day with God, page 255, it reads, To those who have made strange paths for their feet, the Lord offers words of encouragement. He will accept their prayers if they will repent and be converted. Through the infinite sacrifice of Christ and through faith in his name, they may receive the promises of God. The sons of Adam may become sons of God. Oh, how full of thankfulness we should be that by the act of Christ in assuming humanity, fallen men are granted a second trial. Christ places them on vantage ground. Through connection with him, they may be laborers together with God. Through the grace given daily by Christ, they may be elevated and ennobled to become the sons and daughters of God. Friends, that is such a sweet promise. He will give us strength and answer our prayers if we will simply repent and be converted. We're so fortunate and blessed to have a God like this. And friends, this ties in perfectly with my story. 
You see, after I got baptized, I thought things would get easier. But I had a wake-up call coming. I did not continue to foster my relationship with God, and soon I lost sight of him. But I praise God that he never lost sight of me. During fourth and fifth grade, I had a decent time because I stayed active in my church. I still did not truly have God in my life, and I didn't see how he could love me or how I could be forgiven for what I had done. But I loved church, so I thought I was fine. Socially, my fourth and fifth grade years were horrible. But God saw me, and he saw what was going to happen. He saw me gaining a lot of weight, getting bullied and picked on daily, being neglected, and he saw that I was going to die. My family hadn't realized that the counselors or therapists were not doing any good. They thought I was doing great, but I wasn't. I was putting up a smile that was all a lie. I was miserable. I remember crying myself to sleep at night, wondering if anyone could hear me. God could hear me. And he wanted me to come to him for strength. And to see that there was a God in heaven who loved me and wanted to be the friend that I never had. But I kept ignoring him. So the Lord had to send a trial my way. I was going about my day as always keeping to myself and trying to survive on my own, which obviously wasn't working. I got home and as always, went straight to the room to hide. My mom came to my room and she asked me to come into the living room and sit down. I came in, sat down, and I saw my aunt and my grandparents there, which was odd because we normally didn't meet together unless it was a special event, say birthday or holiday. They looked me in the face and said the kindest way they could that my father had passed away. When I heard that, I stood up and screamed for joy. And I'm not exaggerating at all. I stood up there in my living room and me and my brother both screamed, thank you, Lord. You see, just five weeks before that, my father had called and he said, I'm changing, I'm becoming a better man. I'm losing weight, I don't drink anymore, I've started going to church again. And I responded with the words, I hate you, I never wanna see you again, and I wish you were dead. And I got my wish. You see, you need to be careful what you ask for. Because when God steps back, Satan takes control. When you choose Satan, God has to let him do what he wants until you call for help again. I was so angry at my father for all that he had put me through, and I wanted him gone. And the sad truth is, we never know what we have until it's gone. And that was the case with me. I wanted my dad gone, and as soon as he was gone, it took me about five minutes to break down. The scream for joy did not last that long. I was already miserable, and now my father was dead. And this sounds like a story that could never be fixed. Luckily for me, I had an even better father in heaven waiting for me. I went through sixth grade in and out of counseling, many different counselors looking for someone who I was comfortable talking to. But I didn't want to talk. Rather, I wanted to die. I wanted it to be over. But I wasn't going to tell anyone that. I could handle it. Only if I had known what God could give me and the peace that he had to offer me. Through this experience, I began stealing. Started with small things, headphones, toys, food from the cafeteria at the school. And I slowly but surely turned the volume on the items I would take. And eventually, I began stealing from my family. And not just items, I would take cash. And I'm not gonna go too far into the story of how my parents found out, my mom and my grandparents found out that I was stealing, but I will say it's providential. And when she did catch me, she brought me basically, I'm not gonna explain how she got it, but she had a list of everything that I had taken. 
which was basically a giant receipt. And in about three months, it totaled up to about $1,000. When my mother came to me, I broke down in tears. I knew I had done wrong, and I was embarrassed and ashamed. In Matthew 4, verse 17, it says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Friends, I was given a chance to repent, to say I'm sorry, to step back from the life that I had chosen and start a new one. But for some reason, I didn't want to. For some reason, I chose to fight God and to hold on to my worries, my stress, my doubt, and my fear. I didn't want to let any of it go. So the Lord permitted another trial to come my way. It was right before Thanksgiving break, my seventh grade year, about a year after my father passed away. The easiest way to say it is to be blunt. I was put in a mental asylum, a mental facility for one week. It was a Baptist hospital called Sundance Hospital. And one comment I'd like to make is pray for the suicidal. Pray for those who want to end their life, but never put them in an asylum. It does no good. All it does is make the problem worse. When you fill them with antidepressants, it balances that chemical imbalance in their brain only until their problems outweigh the medicine. The only true source of happiness is Christ. In English class, I wrote a descriptive essay about my first five minutes in there. And it reads like this. It was just me, myself, and I. And as I walked down the gray, dimly lit hallway, I saw many things. I passed numerous rooms, which were dark, with padded walls and one small window in each room, just a little bigger than someone's hand. I had no clue where I was or why I was there, because I had been too scared and worried to pay attention. I was only 12 years old. No one should have to go through that. A tall, thin man approached me from the other end of the hall. As he began walking towards me, my stomach sank to my feet. He looked so kind. He looked so kind and welcoming and friendly. Yet I was terrified of him. As he was approaching me, I began to look around the hallway. To my left was a couch for people to sit on. It was gray, dirty, and old, and looked as if a tornado had passed through it. To my right was another hallway. It was endless. There was door after door, and each one had an occupant. From within each room, you could smell a stench that was quite common, which was fear, with a side of depression and loneliness. I looked behind me and saw the place that I had just been. It was the front entrance. I thought about running for the door, but just as I thought about taking off, a firm and forceful hand grabbed my shoulder and turned me around to face him. It was the man who had been approaching me earlier. He looked horrible, as if he hadn't slept in weeks. He looked me dead in the face and said with a kind yet deceptive voice, Hi, I'm Brent. I'm going to be your counselor. We're going to get to know each other very well. I said nothing. I stared him down. He just smirked at me. He took me to one of the rooms in the hallway to my right and opened the door. I went in and he said he would be back shortly. This room was clean, but it instantly became home to something horrifying. It became the home to anger, depression, and regret. It was my own room, and it was just me, myself, and I. Friends, this was my mindset while I was there. It was just me. I was alone. I went through that experience without accepting God's divine strength. I was put on antidepressants and spent a whole week there. While I was there, I saw people get beat up, people going insane. And in that hospital, I had my first experience with contacting the dead. I was in the gymnasium there during recreational time. And I was sitting on the floor against the wall on my own. Then I heard my dad's voice. And he called me by my name. And when your father calls you by your name, you recognize that voice instantly. And you can tell if you're in trouble or if he cares and he wants to talk to you. And this voice, it said, I love you. I want to talk to you. I'm here. I couldn't see him, but I could hear him. And I was so relieved that he was alive. But 
the voice didn't stay happy. It started screaming and becoming distorted beyond all else. I was screaming for help because I got pretty terrified. And the staff there noticed me instantly. A couple of them came and started assessing me. While they were checking me out, the voice left. And that demon did not come back for four years. I continued through the program there and lied my way out of the hospital in one week, just in time for Thanksgiving break. I got out and went straight home and instantly became addicted to video games. They became my source of happiness, temporary happiness. Because the hospital cured me temporarily, I went back to lying and stealing again. The suicidal thoughts got buried because I knew that suicide equaled a mental hospital and I was not going to go back there. You see, as I mentioned earlier, the real cure for depression is not found in pills or any form of medicine. It is found in the true source of happiness, which is Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. Friends, I took those pills and all it did was cover up the real problem. Christ is the only true solution. But at that time, I didn't see that. I came out of that hospital and went straight back to what I had been doing before. The pills they gave me did make some difference, but overall, I was the same person. Eventually, I ran out of the artificial joy that they had given me, as expected. And I continued in my spiral downward, but the Lord was still working on me. I went home and I spent the whole week playing video games and eating because it's Thanksgiving break, so what else am I gonna do? I spent the rest of that year moping in my own misery, but at the same time, I was not gonna let anyone know that. My life was continually getting worse and I was still contemplating suicide. The amount of problems I had in my life increased daily. I even began cussing by slowly but surely working on the scale from small words to big words, as I mentioned earlier slowly turn up the volume until one day you have no idea what you're doing. God was still there though. He had never left me. I went through eighth grade doing the normal things and continually getting worse. Around April of 2015, yes, my mom and my grandmother and I went to visit a new school my mom had told me that it might be good for me and that it could be beneficial. I thought she was crazy. Not gonna lie, I thought she was the craziest person who had ever lived. A vegan school with strict guidelines and it's located in the middle of nowhere. I think not. Friends, our plans are not God's. He is all knowing and he and he alone know, knows what's best for us. Friends, I was never gonna come here and I was determined not to. But when school time rolled around, I packed up my stuff and very willingly got in my car. And here I am. First day was my worst. Because I did not want to talk, anyone, talk to anyone. I sat in the back of the auditorium during the icebreaker and cried because I wanted to go home. One of the students who's, who was in my class at the time, uh, we'll call him Kelvin, he came up to me and he said hi. And to this day, we're still really good friends. Now, I want you to listen up. This is the part that I want you to remember. I've been here for four years now. And every year has been better than the year before. I love it here, and I always will. But at first, it wasn't like that. I liked it here because I could feel God, because the people around me were godly. But I didn't know him for who he was to me. As life went on here, I started becoming used to the feeling of God, and it eventually wasn't enough. The suicidal thoughts that I once had returned. I started drinking my mouthwash and other assorted items whenever I could. I also started seeing weird things, demonic things, and had even weirder dreams. Some were just horrifying, and some came true the next day. I also had my second and last experience with contacting the dead. 
it was the closest I had been to my dad in years. I needed help, but this school couldn't offer me what I needed at that time. So the school had to send me home to see some professionals. I spoke with a man that some of you may be familiar with. His name is Dan Gabbert. He showed me what it meant to know God. Since that day, I have never been happier. Friends, if you remember one thing from tonight's speech, remember this. God is for you. He wants you to come home. He is still waiting on each and every one of you. Repent and run to him daily. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but Jesus' grace is sufficient for us. You will have trials and temptations, but you will be stronger in the end if you rely on his strength. Every day he will continue to mold you and make you into his image, but only if you let him. He's doing it for me, and he can definitely do it for you. Friends, I want to close with this thought. We are Christ's bride. We are his church. And I once heard a comment that a marriage gets sweeter every single year. Friends with God, it gets sweeter every single day. Now, I want you to look at my life. Think of what I went through and think of how much more God did for me. Now think of your own life. Think of what you're going through at this very moment. Things that you're struggling with, trials and temptations, your fear and your doubt. Give it to him. Accept the divine help and divine strength. Is this your desire? Yes. All right. Let's close with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so thankful that you have never left us. Lord, every time we fall, you're there to pick us up. Lord, we see in my life, I left you so many times, but you had never left me. Lord, I once heard the illustration that we're masons building a wall around ourselves, and you're a demolition team holding the sledgehammer, waiting for the command to break it down. Lord, I ask that you will break down our walls. Give us the strength that we so desperately need. Be with, us, be with us now as we depart and bless our families and help us to continue to be a witness for you wherever we go. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.